Good evening. This is Mae Bressel. It's KAZU FM in Pacific Grove, California. The program emanates from that lovely city. This is broadcast number 654, June the 18th, 1984. In the news uh, update what, a year ago, because I keep saying the year goes so quickly, in the news today is very similar and continuous with what we were talking about a year ago. We'll begin immediately with some of the discussions on broadcast 602. That was June the 20th, 1983. I was talking about the militant right, the posse comitatus, the origins of posse comitatus with their links to their hero, Senator Joe McCarthy, going back to Colonel Charles Willoughby and General Douglas MacArthur in the Philippines and a uh, referred to a book, Hitler Directs His War, another interesting book that I read last year about the counterintelligence corps and how the United States Army, within hours of the end of the war, by May the 5th, 1948, had hired people such as Dr. Morell, Hitler's doctor, Hitler's sister Paula, and the, the group around Adolf Hitler to come to work for the Americans. That was May the 5th. The war was officially over by May the 8th, and they were already working for the United States government. There's another interesting book, The Conservative Decade, that I read last year, and it has the background of William Buckley and his activities in Chicago after he left jail, his forming the magazine National Review, becoming publisher of that, and its national, international links to Vienna and Zurich, London, and uh, links to the John Birch Society and the White Citizens Council, and the very far right wing in the United States. This became the chic, the so-called conservative middle, but it had its tentacles into strong conservative Nazi traditional people who did not dislike the fascism in Europe and were really sorry that we had to ally ourselves in order to survive with the Soviet Union. And then in 1960, uh, William Buckley formed the YAF, and I did quite a bit on that before I wrote the Rebel article in November. This was in June when I was talking about the fascist links to William Buckley and Young Americans for Freedom. I also shared information on Robert Byron Watson's uh, affidavits. He gave the House Select Committee on uh, controversial Larry McDonald. Apropos of the Western Goals lawsuit that... A new one was filed just recently against Western Goals, but the Los Angeles Police Department was tangled with Western Goals, and that was Larry McDonald's baby. He was chairman of Western Goals and also president of the John Birch Society, which has to do with the National Review and the YAF. So that the links of the fascist right, and this is the very fascist right with people like John Singlaub and so forth, and Nazis from the Galen Organization, goes back to the time period during and just after World War II and up to the present. And these people are in the news right now. Larry McDonald's airplane crash ended his demise, but the experience, his life, pardon me, but his experience of being down by the Soviet Union, which we'll go into in the second half of this broadcast, will always be etched in American history as the cruel Russians shooting the innocent 269 passengers down. The big lie that Hitler talks about will be perpetuated constantly in reference to that flight and many other things, such as trying to link Lee Harvey Oswald with the Marxists continuously when he's linked to the military intelligence, Navy intelligence, and the FBI and the United States government. I'm not going to update or do new material on the attempt to kill the Pope until next week or the week after. There, It's a toss-up because there's so many vital stories Yesterday's uh, Washington Post and San Jose Mercury had an article about the new trial that's opening up that the uh, investigators in Italy have uncovered a mass of what they call largely circumstantial evidence. They have a 77-page report on the conspiracy to kill the Pope, but the excuse for wanting him dead was that he was funding solidarity, which he did give uh, a big hunk of money to $100 million. But the excuse for killing him was because of the unrest in Poland. It had more to do with the scandals in the Vatican and what was going on. If you read what was surrounding him and John Paul I, who was murdered, and how hard Paul Marcinkus and the Vatican treasurer and, and the secretary and all of them were working to keep the lid on the Vatican, 
banking financial scandals as well as the murders surrounding the scandals. Pope John Paul I did not die. Of course, he didn't. John Paul II, pardon me, did not die. He's very much alive, but they've spent two years and 25,000 pages now collecting what they call uh, circumstantial evidence taken from primarily from Aja, who they admit uh, obtained from publicly available sources, telephone books, and so forth, the very information about the Bulgarian Sea implicated, such as their addresses and so forth. Now, it's very important to NBC and to the CIA and Vernon Walters, and we'll do more on that later, uh, that they squash the idea that our Central Intelligence Agency would want to kill John Paul II. That shooting was in May, and Ronald Reagan was shot at in March by the same forces and the same people exactly. Uh, at the trial of John DeLorean, the excuse or the defense of John DeLorean is Timothy Hoffman, the drug dealer, is such a sleazy character who would believe him. Even though John DeLorean of his own will, free will, and accord is photographed with narcotics in hotel rooms meeting those sleazy people, when he's prosecuted, you say, well, you wouldn't trust a guy like Timothy Hoffman who ran out and didn't pay his full rent or belonged to the drug trafficking. But when it comes to creating a two-year plot to kill the Pope, if you could try to etch it or link it to KGB people and divert it from the Nazis and the werewolves and the CIA... The primary witness is Mehmet Aja, who killed a reporter, publisher in Turkey, who was freed by the right-wing faction, who worked with the Nazis and CIA werewolves, who uh, worked with Frank Turpel, who was a drug dealer. He was a drug dealer, a kill killer, a Nazi, working with Nazi traders and the CIA. So they would want you to believe that he's a credible witness for this trial in Italy and that Timothy Hoffman isn't a credible witness in California. I'm not going to say too much on the Watergate anniversary. This is the 12th anniversary of the break-in of the Watergate Hotel. I just want to update a few items on it. I could do one or two hours on what has happened with many of these people since the Watergate entry. I heard on CNN a week ago Saturday there was a program on arms dealers and Samuel Cummings and supplying the arms for various countries around the world. And quickly in passing, they mentioned that former Attorney General John Mitchell and former Vice President Spiro Agnew have some kind of a company where they manufacture uniforms and sell to the Iraq army. It went so quickly that I have to see if they'll send for a summary of that broadcast. Also this past week, the judge stopped the release of the Nixon papers. You can't get the transcripts of the conversations through the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, they are protecting Nixon. They want to resurrect him. They either have to bury him or resurrect him because he knows too much to keep silent, and he keeps popping up. But he's just... Uh, the Phoenix program wasn't meant for the people in Southeast Asia. I think it was the title for the government officials who keep reappearing and appearing like Herman Apps or John McCloy. Or it used to be Leon Jaworski. The only thing that stops them from popping up is when they're actually dead. But if they're alive, they're always in the media. They're media freaks, and the media plays up to them. So you, they will not allow you to hear any more scatological and dirty words or incriminating evidence. So uh, Nixon is home free anyway. He can't be charged for any crimes, but he's pretty filthy mouthed and pretty sneaky. So the government is protecting him while the media plays up his image. They shouldn't have him on anything until they hear the tapes to see what kind of a person they're talking to. But I'm talking about an ideal world, not the practical world. We have a private school over in Pebble Beach, Robert Louis Stevenson, and they had a graduation just a week ago, and President Gerald Ford spoke at the graduation. And the Monterey Herald described they were so proud, they said they noted that this was the first time a president or former president had spoken at a commencement at the school, but he has some friends at the school and friends of President Ford live in the area. Well, 50% of Pebble Beach is owned by Marvin Davis, and Ford, Gerald Ford's on the board of 20th Century Fox, so that's no mystery. The school is on his property. He owns the price, you know, head of the corporation that owns the property, along with Henry Kissinger and the other characters I talk about. But the problem that I see here is that they bring in these characters that are not elected president. He was appointed by a crook who refused to face his impeachment hearings because he knew he was wrong down the line and be impeached and maybe even sent to jail. He appoints the man that he put, same man that he put on the Warren Commission to hide the killing of a president of the United States. It's a crime to cover up an investigation, and he should have been put in jail for the cover-up, Gerald Ford, and for leaking things to Henry Luce in Time magazine 
there were outright lies about Lee Harvey Oswald. But instead of that, he is brought in, not only appointed by Nixon to be on the Warren Commission, but he's appointed as the new president. They push uh, Carl Albert out of the way. The Constitution stands for nothing. Where the man that should be vice president is just pushed down somewhere like a squash. You never see him or hear about him. And in comes the great Jerry Ford, who then has the distinction of being president. I'm not worried about our generation or my generation, but the young people graduating from school who look starry-eyed and say, President Ford was at our graduation and don't even know what a scumbag he is. The young people don't have a chance to analyze the public figures to see who they are and to know whether they like them or don't like them. They're told they're great, they're wonderful. And so Ford is out here on the peninsula at a graduation. I wish the students at Robert Louis Stevenson could get a little more insight into what's going on in the world. On the anniversary of Watergate, I got a letter from uh, Paul Krasner. He said there's an article coming out in People magazine, June the 11th, on 40 reporters on the 60 activists, and he was supposed to get a full page. Well, June 11th has come and gone, and he didn't get a full page, and he said, at last my parents will be proud. That does make you wonder if his parents have to see him in People magazine to be proud. Then in the running press uh, uh, magazine, I guess, or journal, I've never seen it, they're going to have a anthology of the satire from the realists, but he didn't give them sections of Martha Mitchell. They were going to put some serious pieces, but he says Martha Mitchell will not un- undergo the cutting knife. That means the best article he ever printed in the realist will not be printed. Uh, he doesn't ask me if I mind them putting sections. He just says, I don't want to do that, but St. Martin's Press is going to print his autobiography, and there's going to be an entire chapter on the Watergate, and he asked me uh, the reaction I had, what it felt like for me back in 1972. He said it would help to have, a from different points of view, if you have time and inclination to type out a few paragraphs on what it felt like to you back in 72, I'd certainly appreciate it. And then there was more personal business in the letter. Well, it's 12 years from now, and I'll just give you a few sentences of what I answered to Paul Krasner. I said, Dear Paul, it's kind of sad that thinking a full-page picture of you and people will make your parents happy or even proud. My aged parents, 94 and 90 years old, would feel I did something wrong to be in the company of Luce's publications. They're not so politically astute, but they'd think that was weird. It's 12 years since we met. At the time, I was trying to explain to you about Nixon and the Nazi connections of how Nixon came to power. Chile was one of Nixon's masterpieces, and together they gather and continue their pledges to the Fourth Reich. You have to admire the loyalty of the right. Sections of Martha Mitchell could and should be wherever realist or underground press is remembered. They'll let you print funny things, but when comedians get political, whether it's Lenny Bruce or you or Mart Saul or anyone else, Down comes the axe. What did it feel like in 1972? Whatever adventure you had in publishing any of my three articles, starting with the Martha Mitchell Watergate story, I really don't believe that you appreciated what you were publishing or the meaning of these stories. These three stories told it all, from Reinhard Galen's World War II to the excuse for repressive laws today for FBI Operation Chaos COINTELPRO program, the phony terrorist SLA CIA. There isn't a thing that has happened in the past 12 years that has negated anything you published in those three years the Watergate story, the Senate cover up, or the terrorist and the American terrorism formed SLA CIA. I could tell you what I felt then the excitement of coming upon serious truths with you and the realization that you were getting great articles. That was your momentary high, easily replaced with drugs, LSD, marijuana. You and your gang copped out, and you fell out. Whatever you had then, you lost it as far as I'm concerned. Loyalty and friendship went out the window, and whatever was going on a social political basis, in your mind, it was so thin that people like you allowed the Reagan Mace Kissinger crowd to take over. I don't mean him alone, but he he just stopped all political activities except a few silly articles that were print, allowed to be printed. I said, all you have to do is realize that I never stopped trying to understand this society and to explain it to people. And you have to see the titles of the weekly programs for the past 13 years to know there was a continuous link. And I didn't stop and pick up 12 years later. 
Didn't we have fun in 1972 doing the Watergate? Tell me how good it was. The time was right, I suppose, to meet you when we did and to share getting those issues out. It serves no purpose now to write about the past because what followed was so hollow. Going over the past is fun for me and meaningful only with those people who have traveled the same road all along the way. Uh, as I say, I don't jump uh, leapfrog into history. Some friends, you have a memory of a certain thing and you go back and remember it. But the political problems that we're talking about, the assassinations, the oppressions, the Cold War, the torture, the tiger cages, the death squads, that has been continuous. And those people that think they can pick up and leave off because they write a letter, it has no meaning for me and I don't want to be in their anthologies or books. I'd rather write a book about what they were doing in the interim. They wake up like Rip Van Winkle and want to begin life wondering where the middle section was, and that's not for me. Now, for some quick uh, items on current deaths and Ronald Reagan's meat, and then we'll go on to the Korean Airlines. The article on that champion horse swale was interesting. I don't read too many sports pages. I read the front pages. But here he's at the height of his career. Swell's victory in the Belmont brought him to the peak of a checkered career. Then they wonder why he runs so well and drops dead. No heart attack. Cause of death won't be known for two, three weeks. Doesn't this remind you of all the other deaths we see? We know there's no conspiracy. We know there's no hoax. But we won't tell you what it was for three weeks. Asked if there was any chance of foul play. They said if it was done, it was done extremely subtly. We never may find out what killed Swale. The news analysts and reporters have the same shtick that they've done with the Belushis and the Lennons and all these other people. We may never really know. Well, in Lennon's case, they blamed Mark David Chapman because they saw him or ja Catherine Smith with the uh, the uh, heroin and the cocaine for Belushi. But for the most part, the descriptions of deaths of people is so vague that we will never know. The similarity, of course, is the height of victory. He he died of, like, the Otis Redding disease, or he was in a plane. Jim Croce was in a plane. Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Mama Cass, you name them. They, We may never know where it was an overdose, these mysterious things, but all of them had a common denominator, whether it was Elvis Presley or any of them. But they were at the height of their career, and they were doing very well. There was no reason to drug out. There was no reason to suicide or anything like that. But they've gotten so used to rich write the obituaries on the people that they can do the same story on the animal and I had to mention it because it sounds just identical to the other shtick we get in the news a friend from New York sent me a copy of the New York Post on David Kennedy's death there are a lot of small articles updating this not much in the news that is new except that the Post mentioned that he had rented a car down in Florida for the spring vacation and uh, he took this car, and they learned that the post learned that the back window of the rented car in Palm Beach that he had during Easter was smashed in, and that there were bullet holes in the back of the window. The window was either shattered by a bullet, or the blow with a blunt instrument, perhaps a hammer. And they also said, at further adding to the mystery, the sources said two men were in the car, and neither was David Kennedy. So. Uh, they, well, of course, would link it to a drug purchase or a drug arrest, not an arrest, a purchase of drugs or conflict. But how many people going out in Palm Beach during Easter week in order to get a hit where it's all over the streets have a bullet hole in the window and two people driving your car and uh, they don't have their own car or transportation, which they obviously had, and broken window or whatever. But these little pieces are just scattered around and like the German woman that was going to leave the country and so forth. You just pick them up and try to figure out what it all means. You know it means something, but it takes a lot more, and the people that should be looking into it aren't doing it. An interesting death in Egypt this last week, June the 6th. Prime Minister Fuad Moedin, M-O-H-I-E-D-D-I-N. He died of a heart attack a few minutes after he went to his office in Cairo. He's a doctor, and he's also the Prime Minister of Egypt. The thing that caught my eye was that they had a very controversial uh, election in Egypt where one of the top officials was murdered. The main opponent against Mubarak had been killed. This was a big challenge to Mubarak's career and uh, one of the people that was running in that election had been been killed. Um, just simultaneously with the elections like the eve of the primary when Robert Kennedy 
wins the nomination for the Democratic Party. He dies on the eve of the primary. There was one death, uh, one murder in Egypt in the, at the time these elections took place last week. They were at the end of May. And the week after the election, Mr. Moedin died of a heart attack. His successor is the reason the article, well, one of the reasons it caught my eye, the government named Kamal Hassan Ali, the deputy prime minister, to become now the acting prime minister. During Moedin's life, he formed the cabinet for Mr. Mubarak after Sadat was murdered. But if you go back to the broadcast, I did number 515 and 514. Those are October the 11th and October 18th. In 1981, three years ago, I was talking about the murder of Sadat, how Mr. Mubarak was at the home of George Bush October the 4th and Sadat was uh, dead October the 6th. And I also mentioned the these people uh, who have moved up into office, not only him, but Kamal Hassan Ali, the foreign minister, he was the one who was working with Thomas Kleins of the CIA, associate of Edward Wilson, of course, and Frank Turple and George Bush from the Task Force 157 group. Uh, they were setting up a sh arms shipment after the Camp David Agreement. Sadat made a deal with Israel, and in return, they were to receive billions of dollars of weapons for Sadat. The Camp David Accord was signed in March of 79, and an office was signed, a contract was signed with a company called Tursum in April of 79. It was a little-known company with no experience in shipping. It was a dummy front out of Geneva set up with the Egyptian front man from Washington, D.C., run by Thomas Kleins of the CIA. The Washington man was Hussein Salem. And one of the people who pushed the arrangement, the middleman between the CIA and the Egyptian uh, arrangement for the money, which didn't go to Sadat, went to the PLO, to Sadat's enemies, making way for Mubarak. It went to Kamal Hassan Ali. He was the foreign minister who pushed the arrangement that the CIA and Thomas Kleins, the former head covert deputy chief, would be arranging the shipment of these millions of dollars. Uh, the offices were set up in Geneva in June of 79, and Mubarak's brother-in-law, General Sabet, was one of the people. So the exclusive shipment of weapons was done with the CIA and with the new prime minister who just took over. He was instrumental in working with uh, the Ms. our CIA and uh, uh, getting the weapons to the PLO. And that's a good way to do it. If the Jews in America or the Congress don't want to send money to the PLO, you let the CIA set up the office in Geneva, then instead of it going to Sadat, it goes to the PLO. It's in the paper. It's very easy. And if you follow it, um, you see the pattern of how they get their weapons and how we bypass the wishes of the Congress or country like Israel. October 13, 1982, Jack Anderson had a story on that Egyptian American Transport and Service Company, EATSCO, and that's the same company with CIA officer, the official Thomas Kleins, and with Egyptian defense minister then and head of the intelligence, Kamal Hassan Ali. He was head of the intelligence then. He's now the prime minister. The other one dropped dead one week after the elections, and he was the one that was saying the CIA and the Pentagon and the Egypt Egyptian government would work through the CIA in handling the weapons to Egypt, which then, as I say, were diverted so that they didn't get into the hands of Sadat and his friends, but uh, they were diverted to uh, PLO, a good hunk of them, or a share of them. So the CIA is doing their business there. While on the surface there's a peace accord, uh, they're sending money to the enemies of uh, Begin over there, and Sadat and that group have the money transferred from the CIA, and that's sort of the appeasement of the PLO, I guess, to sign the Camp David Accord. So you sign a thing, a piece of paper, which is already negated and dead three years later, and the PLO is getting weapons. Now, I have been very conscious of meat and meat poisoning and animal and beef. I don't tell you what to eat, but I haven't eaten it in six years. And the Los Angeles Herald had an article last week on the steroids in meat. And it, you can write to Representative James Howard, Democrat of New Jersey, He's co-sponsoring with 36 other members of Congress a bill to create a commission to look in every aspect of farm animal products, the chemicals and the drugs that go into the animals. Now, the animals get testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, uh, anabolic steroids such as Xeranol, 
The side effects include weight gain, fluid retention, onset of diabetes, aggressiveness, elevated blood fats, early onset of puberty. The thing that I'm worried about when they say aggressiveness is they recognize then that it alters behavior. And I believe that if you think of the meat factories that we have giving a certain age group and the poverty level people, certainly more than anybody else, this constant beef and what you're getting out of the masses who are really oppressed and don't get a fair shake is not anger or aggressiveness, but lethargy, disproportionate to the times. Think of Jack of the Box and Wendy's and McDonald's and the Sizzler and all the different hamburger places there are where you get quick, fast food. The big boy, and, and you could name about 20 of them quickly, where you get beef. But the interesting part about this article that wasn't limited to a scientific magazine is this. It said, for the past 25 years, Ronald Reagan has his own butcher who supplies his specially organically fed meat. He gets calves, and they're raised on the ranch. They, they buy these calves, raise them on the ranch, and he has a gentleman do the butchering, and the meat is served to the Secret Service. They pick up the meat. But he's been doing this not since he was president to protect him, but for 25 years since 1959. And that's when the chemicals and the CIA began their warfare against the people in America full scale. And 1959 is when you begin to get the escalation of weird diseases just like now. It's the Alzheimer or the AIDS. Uh, I believe that there are diseases that are prevalent everywhere now that began in this time period in 1959. So we not only have the chemical addition to the meat but we, and the prolification of so many meat places and young people eating this meat, but the President of the United States doesn't touch it. Nancy doesn't say, Ronnie, go down and get that meat. And uh, so he's protected. He knows something we don't know. I myself don't eat it and haven't, and uh, uh, I prefer not to, and I feel better when I see that also. Now, Edwin Meese's name was in the news just quickly on NBC. Connie Chong said Sunday that he got a subpoena to show up at the Marvin Pancoast trial for the murder of Vicki Morgan. There's a new book coming out. It's called Bloomy. The author is Sheldon Davis. He was a long, long friend of Alfred Bloomingdale's. There's an excerpt of it in Globe, June the 5th. It tells about Bloomingdale's 500,000-a-year habit with prostitutes, 250 annually for Vicky. How he used 45 countries of his own diners club to fix up women all over the country. His need for mass sex, for sex slavery, um, his hermaphrodites, his arrangements for his women. Uh, this is an interesting little tidbit of a book, Bloomy, coming out just at the time of elections for a man who's on the president's foreign intelligence advisory board and Nancy and Ronnie's best friend. Also, Time Magazine has a story, A Mistress's Life and Death. You might get a copy, if you don't have it, of the page, May 21st, 1984, page 41. There's an article about Vicki Morgan and Marvin Pancoast and how when the Los Angeles Police Department uh, got the report when he went in and said he killed her, with, uh, and he confessed right away, but he claimed somebody else did it, and they took that quick confession without a lawyer or anybody. And he's been in mental hospitals, and it could be programmed to confess it because there's no evidence he did it. Time says the prosecution's case against Pankos is far from ironclad. Beyond his now repudiated confession, there is no hard evidence that he killed her. There's a strong, a strong motive has not been established except the fact that she had tapes of the president's cabinet and the president's high government officials. But at the scene of the crime, they recovered no fingerprints from the baseball bat that Marvin Pankos had, nor did the district attorney's office interview any material witness at the time. The deputy district attorney, Stanley Weisberg, lamely said, we had more cases, other cases more important than that. The LAPD talked to Kathy Smith after John Belushi was dead, told her to get out of town and hadn't pressed charges. These are friends and people are involved with the Reagan administration and close to the Reagan administration in actual murders of people from a movie or comedy or a close friends that they've used through the years. It mentions a presidential counselor, Edwin Meese, who is among Morgan's fa friends and filmed. Uh, these movies were filmed, Mr. Barron says, of them, and they've subpoenaed him finally. The judge didn't want to turn it into a sex trial, but the attorney for Marvin Pankos wants to show there was a motive to kill Vicki Morgan and Marvin Mitchelson, who was the original attorney until Reagan called him to the White House and ordered him to not handle the case anymore, and I did tapes on that. 
He insists that the White House aides confirmed over a year ago there were such tapes. So we'll take a one-minute break. This updates some of the murders that I want to keep track of, so there's so many. And murder by chemical meat or mind manipulation by meat poisoning and steroids. And it's in poultry, too. Lamb, veal. It's not just cow. And the pig, of course. We'll take one-minute break, and we'll be back to continue on uh, the next side of, half of this broadcast, the next side of the tape on the Korean airline. Good evening. This is Mae Bressel on part two of broadcast number 654, June 18th, 1984. There was a story that came out just this weekend on the Korean jet based upon a defense magazine out of Great Britain. And I think the reason they must be investigating the Korean airline is that this is a very important story because Ronald Reagan is trying to push with William Casey and Vernon Walters and the CIA and the whole gang the bad, evil empire of the Russians, the attempted assassination of the Pope, to spend two years on twisting that around when they won't investigate the Nazi connections or the George Bush connections, say, to John Hinckley here, or the CIA connections to Aja, they're ignoring. They're trying to take the provocation of an airplane being blown up with 269 people by the evil Soviet Union, take the assassination attempt on the Pope by the evil Antichrist KGB. And these are nails in our coffin that can trigger off World War III every time they come, and they're not going to let you forget them, and they control your history when they control your lives. So you have to remember that when in the grenade invasion, the excuse was so feeble, it was the chance to reactivate the special forces, the Green Berets, to laud them. They separate them from the regular army, like the Wehrmacht was separated from the Liebensdart, the Waffen-SS. So the, the Grenada part story this last year that I've done extensive work on, the Korean airline story, and the shooting of the Pope have really taken a lot of detail to study, but they're so terribly important they must be updated. So I do want to run, as I say today, I'm just going to do as much as I can on the Korean airline because, again, it was in the news, San Francisco Chronicle has Korea jet snooping, British rider says. Well, when we have a break-in at the Watergate, it's called, you know, some kind of a little uh, quirk. or a, They play it down with words to make it look like it's a minor thing, make a joke out of it, and like a Max Senate comedy when it isn't. But that's okay. We'll take the word snooping. The story in the paper, the South Korean airline shot down by Soviet fighters was on an intelligence mission to the, uh, using testing Soviet radar reactions. The magazine, the Defense, it's called Defense uh, in Great Britain, is a very serious magazine. And there was an article in the Sunday Observer at great length about the defense report. It said the Boeing 707 that crashed out in the sea of Osh, O-K-H-O-T-S-K, I haven't pronounced that right, but that's your spelling, killing uh, 269 of the occupants, didn't have electronic eavesdropping in it or camera, but was steered deliberately, and listen to these words based upon another report from Great Britain, was steered deliberately into Soviet airspace so that Western intelligence could monitor the Soviet radar and electronic signals. Now, that's pretty hard to do with fail-proof equipment, so that steered deliberately are really hard words. Of course, the White House denied it. A man using a pseudonym, I can see why, PQ man, claimed that a close-orbiting ferret, F-E-R-R-E-T, capital F, spy satellite, and the just-launched Challenger, which we had going, the space shuttle, monitored the Korean airline jet. They were used to monitor it. You know, while they monitored it, they could have told it it was off course if it wanted to. They knew where it was all along. But the magazine says that the entry with the Soviet radar range of the U.S., the RC-135 military aircraft, which used to be a Boeing airplane made into the military aircraft, and made by Boeing, the same company, is a similar profile to the commercial airline. So they aimed at getting the Russians to turn on their defense radar and the co critical communication link between the Far East and Moscow. They triggered that out. Now, many of us have known that for a long time, but we didn't know, or maybe you didn't know, that the Challenger was above and the spy satellite was uh, 
working along with them. The military plane flew out of the area, leaving its buddy all alone, and Ronald Reagan said that was miles away, like 75 miles away, while the orbiting spacecraft monitored Soviet signals concentrating on the airliner. Now, here's the airliner flying through the dark with a controversial congressman who's the president of the John Birch Society. John Birch was the first American killed in China by the Red Chinese. So now you have the president of John Birch Society. You're going to test all this multi-billion dollar equipment. You're going to let Buddy Boy sail off in the wild blue yonder because you haven't lost anything. You've gained mileage of propaganda. You've made mileage of committees protesting at the Olympics, the Korean airline. You have every speech of the president. The rabid right wing, remember the Korean airlines. that They got more mileage out of this, just as Hitler did in burning the Reichstag, than he did in rebuilding the building if he wanted it. If you could bomb the Capitol in Washington and say that leftist guerrillas did it, you would get your money back rebuilding. It would be pennies compared to the propaganda mill. So off it goes into the wild blue. This is a new study done in England. There was another story uh, two weeks before that, May 23, 1984. Soviet general linked the Korean jet is dead. A, this is the general, Colonel General Semyon Romanov. That's easy to spell. Some names aren't. 62 years old, my age. He died in the line of duty. He was in East Germany. Keep in mind that, <laughs> that's the term I learned from David Emery, keep in mind. I was listening to tapes last week on K from KFJC, and I, I, that term stayed in my brain. Okay. Romanov was from East, in G East Germany at the time he died. They wouldn't say where he died or how he died, but that's a term used if you're killed in an accident. There are many people in East Germany, Poland, Romania, and Czechoslovakia that belong to the Reinhard Galen, William Casey, Casey was behind the lines, and the CIA, the OSS CIA, that can do jobs for us if or for anybody they want in those countries if they want to wipe them out. He was chief of staff of the Air Defense Forces, part of the Soviet military. He was the person who was accounting for the Korean airline from September the 1st on. General Romanov, for four days, was the spokesman. He said the South Korean airline flew without lights that its outline resembled the RC-135, which the new study in Great Britain has done. It's almost a year since then. That an American reconnaissance plane was used to patrol off the, the Soviet Union's coast, the 135, and it resembled this transport, this civil airport plane, the, the civilian plane, or it should be a civilian, it wasn't really, to it followed alongside and then split. He said that. The general said that a Soviet fighter intercepted the airline, fired tracer shells. The warnings were ignored. General Romanov said that the fate of the airline, uh, the ultimate fate of the airliner was unclear. Uh, the initial statement he left was the ultimate fate was unclear the first time. The definitive account was presented five days later by another high-ranking general who gave the account of the United States going into their territory, and that it was necessary to uh, do what they did and warn them and try to tell them. And General Romanov was one of the most honored people in the Soviet Union. He had three dozen medals. He worked against the Nazis. He'd been in the armed forces since 1940 and served with great valor and, as I say, got the highest honors, the hero of the Soviet Union, the country's highest military award. Well, he was saying... Uh, as soon as the accident of the plane going down took place, exactly what was happening, that was September the 1st. Now a group of people all over the world are investigating that airplane crash and coming up with the same conclusions. But the interesting thing, and I'm going into details on this, the London Times had a two-part article on the Korean airline based on a lot of investigation for the past eight months. And the two-part article began May the 20th. And the second part is May 27th. And sandwiched in between there, on May 23rd, General Romanov was dead. Just days, the day after the British report in the London Times came out, he never lived long enough to say, I told you so. This is what the Soviet Union was saying. The scientists and the Defense Department of London, I suppose, 
wants to know why it went down, because for their own safety. Is the Soviet Union going to shoot civilian planes down, or is America lying? Because they're going to have people or might have had people on that plane or other planes. So it's to their best interest and everybody's interest, if you ride a civilian airplane at any time a commercial airline, to find out how the government uses it for spying if it wants to, and that you are literally a sitting duck, that you are uh, uh, not considered a person. You are a victim of their plans to use a civilian airplane to test something that is going to happen. And if that doesn't scare you, then you've been eating too much beef with steroids in it. That's the only reason I, way I can count for it. Now, the London Times has two full-page stories, not just a little bit of articles. I mean, large articles on this interesting title. And the big black letters in the center of the story where it begins, It's the title is called Human Error Common, or What Really Happened to the Korean 747. And they have big black letters, like two or three inches, the inevitable shoot-down. Not because Russia is evil, but it was inevitable. And they have this in back letters that explains part, what the story is about, written by Murray Sale, S-A-Y-L-E. No incident has caused more outrage in recent years than the shooting down of the Korean 747 since all 269 passengers on and crew on board were killed. But it was an event that fitted only too well with the twisted political myths of our time. It reinforced President Reagan's claim that Soviet Russia was nothing but an empire of evil. Those direct quote. Quote, at the same time, it allowed the Russians to counterclaim that the plane was on a CIA spying mission and its presence over the Soviet territory was a criminal provocation. Given all the circumstances, technical, human, political, the Korean jet was doomed within a few minutes of its takeoff. Now, that is the Sunday London Times, and for some of you who are serious researchers, I can copy this for you. It takes a lot of time, but it's worth it if you want to own it. I'll copy them for you. It's several large pages, and I've outlined the article. I'll give you the essence of the article. Given Ronald Reagan and the political myths, the twisted political myths of our time, and Ronald Reagan's claims, they began this extensive research. Now, the highlights of the article are this, that there was a major overhaul of that airplane August the 10th, three weeks before the shoot-down, which is interesting because I don't know what you do to cars or planes or if that had anything to do with it, but it, the flight originated at Kennedy Airport. It used the American Airlines terminal. It originally was flown by Lufthansa in 1972, had its major overhaul three weeks early. There's a class action suit that I mentioned before to you on the air that the U.S. government is a defendant on the grounds of alleged inadequate navigational aids and supervision on their route over the North Pacific. Boeing, Litton Industries are named because they made the navigate one made the plane and one made the navigation equipment. And Jepson Sanderson Incorporated, the map publishing firm, is sued because their air map does not specify that when you fly over Soviet territory, you may be fired without warning. They don't have to give you any warning. The United States government air maps and the United States pilots know that the pilot for the president of South Korea, a military pilot with the Korean CIA, had military maps, so he knew it. He's not a man that didn't work for the military. Somebody who's been with a I know, friend who flies TWA, he's been there 20, 30 years but he, he wasn't flying these planes such as the pilot of this plane. 200 passengers were listed. There were 269 died, so the six, there had to be a crew of 69 or some we don't know about. Uh, Larry McDonald, of course, the controversial person, congressman from the John Birch Society, according to this article, was a member of a group of congressmen invited by the Asiatic Research Center of Korea for their 30th anniversary. The author says he was part of a group but if you remember my article I did for Hustler on Korean Airline 007, Larry McDonald went with a group from Congress, but he went alone. He didn't even have a buddy with him. And all the others, they violently anti-communist, and he mentions this point, the De Senator Jesse Helms, even more prominent conservative, Carol Hubbard, a Democrat, Senator Stephen Sims, and so forth. This staunchy anti-communist trio flew from by a different aircraft. 
and Larry McDonald was on this plane, the one that was sent in and was doomed from the beginning, and they knew he was on it. The landing for approach and departure to the airport is laid out in magnetic headings. Now, there's a little bit of technicality that I have to go at length with you to describe what happened to the pl plane and also what happened to the pilot's state of mind because I contended since my first original study of the case that he was a kamikaze mind control to just keep going straight into the territory to not see and hear whatever happened and he had no direction uh, I didn't know the mechanical problems at the time I knew his state of mind now there are two factors that keep this plane foolproof one you read about the INS the inertial navigation system that's carried within the aircraft it has its own battery but there's three of them independent three independent ones they're made by Linton industry if one is in error, electronically, it's voted out. In other words, they don't have like two flashlights where one doesn't work and you use your second. They keep three INS systems so two can vote out that one is giving the wrong information and the other two are uh, correct and one is off. And this, they'll not, it, it's foolproof, it can't really go wrong. Along with that, combined with INS is the VOR, that's the Omnidirectional Radio Beacon. It's modern, it's accurate, it broadcasts beams of radio waves, it radiates like spokes or radials. Pilots can locate within a mile, as far away as 60 miles from their transmitter, and they, it's highly accurate, used near major airfields. It's, we'll tray, it's the radio beams are the VOR, and the part of the navigational system in the airplane is the INS, and combined, according to this author, this is how most pilots and co-pilots operate their equipment, and it's for complete accuracy. The human navigator can plot on charts, and that used to go wrong, the early pilots. But young pilots, the young have all been brought up on this system, all but infallible system. And the, this is the description of the system. The KAL had this equipment, and then the author catches himself in one sense. He says all of it was in working order. Korean pilots are finished with all these tools of the trade. But then, you read further in the article, the radio equipment, the VOR, was not working, and it has to synchronize with the INS to be accurate. So you have, uh, it's like having tires on your car. If you have one flat, you know, they've got to all be going together. Not quite the same, because they're all similar. But the VOR and the uh, INS have to be synchronized. Now, the Korean airline collected their flight plan, the pilot, Captain Chung Bin In, B-Y-U-N-G, but we'll call him Captain Chun, 45 years old, as I say, the most, one of the most experienced in all South Korea and the personal pilot for the president. The pl flight plan was given to them. It was prepared by Continental Airlines out of Los Angeles. Now, no connection, but I wonder about Larry McDonald and Western Goals and Los Angeles Police Department and the scandals of the LAPD the expose of the Western Goals, and they had, partly because of that scandal, they settled out of court without going to trial with 131 plaintiffs. The links uh, of the LAPD, the scandals of their spying and so forth, and then tying it in to Larry McDonald, who soon to go down on this plane and to get attention from May until September about him in the newspapers almost every day, uh, is an interesting fact that the plans for the navigation were set in Los Angeles, the navigational systems, and Captain Chun's responsibility is to sign it. He, it's a notice to the airman, which means he signed it, he studied it, N-O-T-A-M-S is the system, notice to the airman. That means I read it, it's clear, we're ready to go. They're ready to take off, but things on the ground weren't quite normal. This is the explanation of what went wrong. They first go to Bethel, B-E-T-H-E-L, that's the first leg of their journey to Seoul, South Korea. It's a small hamlet 300 miles south of Anchorage, 246 degrees magnetic, and Captain Chung has his INS ready, and he's programmed to go to Bethel to take the airline there, and he has his co-pilots who are well experienced and so forth. He, they first stop. When they get to Bethel, they turn their small rotary switch, their automatic pilot. They fly infallibly, but they have to get there, and they use that INS and the VOR. But, but, says the author of this article, the VOR at the Anchorage airport was out of action for 12 hours that day. 
Therefore, Captain Chun had nothing handy to check the INS against. Now, the second part of this article next, uh, the next week tells how he was in, told that Larry McDonald was there and later they assumed he went down and sat with him and so forth. So he knew who was on the airplane and where he was going. But at Anchorage, there was a 12-hour delay. Now, as I understand reading it earlier, his cohorts took off from the airport and people, little girl was sitting in on his knee and then went off to South Korea and left him. And you remember those sad stories of, of the people at the airport? Well, it worked for them, but it didn't work for him. For 12 hours, this this person is saying that Chung uh, had to accept the fact either to go or not to go because the VOR radio work wasn't done. He had to get to Bethel first, where there was a functioning VOR, that's the radio signal. He could pick it up and synchronize it to his navigational system once he got the few hundred miles down there but otherwise he'd be out of range until he just got that short distance. One of the notices he signed for at Anchorage when he was informed that the VOR was not working was that he had an hour to resolve this. He could either, he had choices. He could ask the tower to tell them where the radar image showed him the correct bearing, but he didn't ask them for that. He knew his bearing wasn't right, and he, before he signed it, he had one hour to decide what to do. And this article says he had this hour this isn't co uncommon. Well, you see how many planes have crashed since then, so it's pretty uncommon. And there were instructions to him, implied cryptic instructions, telling him, proceed to Bethel when able. It didn't say, don't proceed to Bethel until the radio part is synced. It said, proceed to Bethel when able. And as I say, his possibilities are to wait until he got the right bearing. He could have used his INS to help him get the bearing. He could have used the NDB, the non-directional bearing, going over Karen Mountings halfway to Bethel to get a check. And when closer to Bethel, he hoped to capture the radial check to get things synchronized so that he could proceed on his way safely. And as I say, I'm not aware that any other planes leaving Anchorage that day didn't arrive where they were going. And if you tell me they smashed up, I'd like to know which ones they were. So the conclusion is that when this huge plane with 269 people and controversial Larry McDonald, whose name was on the front page of the Washington Post, August the 18th, and it regards that lawsuit in Los Angeles, and his links to the military and the mafia and the hit teams and the uh, Munich assassins, this controversial guy is going to be on a plane where the pilot is going to carry a magnetic compass to steer this huge plane. Now, there's a radio tower dialogue between Chung, the pilot, and Anchorage, Alaska. This is his last talk with Anchorage. And they told him to try to get close to Bethel to capture his appropriate radial signals that sink in. And they hand him over from the local controller in Anchorage to the air route traffic control center, which is to supervise all traffic over the North Pacific. The supervisors are radar installation at a place called Kenai, K-E-N-A-I, south of Anchorage. Now, the VOR isn't working. He is deviating from his track, and Kenai radar picks up that he's off course 10 minutes out of Anchorage, Alaska. He's going off course. He ends up 359 miles inside the Soviet Union, but within 10 minutes of Anchorage, he is headed in the wrong direction. It reminds me of the example I always give about people trying, when they're playing pin the tail on the donkey when you're younger, and if, if somebody's honest and you're blindfolded, and you hold that tail, you have a chance of maybe sticking the tail and the pin into the butt of the donkey. But if somebody's unkind and turns you a little the other direction, you can walk into a garage or car, and everyone else stands there laughing, and you won't hit your mark by a long shot, depending which way you're spinning. Ten minutes out of Anchorage, Alaska, the Air Route Traffic Control Center notices that he is already off course, but they were not notified of the difference. So one problem was the VOR wasn't working. Two, he within 10 minutes, he's off course. Three, they weren't notified, and the crew was not alerted. This is in the article in the London Times. They said the deviation wasn't considered uh, a more than a minor one that he was off course. Now, the fourth point is that he passes Bethel, the Korean airline, it was 12 miles off track at that point, just a few hundred miles south. The information that he was off track came from the American military radar station at the King Salmon Islands 
uh, 200 King Salmon Station, 220 miles southwest of Anchorage. The King, it was part of the military, knew the plane was off course, but they also did not alert them that the plane was off because they handle military planes and not civilian. Now, if it was a military plane, he would know which one it was flying. And if it was a civilian, he'd know they shouldn't be there because if it isn't the usual route for civilian planes going to South Korea or anywhere else, they might ask somebody else in the military to alert that this particular plane or what is the plane, and because it just left Anchorage, you'd find out it's a 747 with 260, 269 civilians. So the radio tower was out in Anchorage, the VOR system. The route traffic control center let them go and knew they were 10, mi 10 minutes out of Anchorage that they were deviating. They were 12 miles out over Bethel, and they, the American Pentagon did not tell them they were off course because they're not part of the civil air traffic control system. There's the military and the civil. When you want a, mili when you want a civil airplane to be blown up, in the military operation, you call it a civilian flight. But when you put military people on it, such as the pilot for the president of South Korea and the Korean CIA and Army, and he's flying this plane with 268 other Chinooks who don't know the difference, who are getting their pillows and blankets and ready to settle down and sleep, and they're sitting on a plane with Larry McDonald, and this article says that their error was made right from the start. They could not have been flying on a radio broadcast from Bethel with the VOR, there's no way, nor could they have been engaged into the INS system, or it would have brought the aircraft directly over Bethel, and the errors would have been changed. The airplane was steering the Korean airline. It had to use a simple magnetic compass. It had a rendezvous with disaster. Unknown to the crew of the airliner, the cabin staff was distributing pillow and blankets that night. The Red Army was testing new weapons. Their radar would be picked up. They'd pick up the Korean airline as it slides in. This doesn't yet link it to the 135, but here goes our Korean airline just over the newly fortified Kamchatka Peninsula. K-A-M-C-H-A-T-K-A. Bye-bye, American Pie. Remember that song? Bye-bye, Larry McDonald. Alone on that plane. Now, why was he alone? Why weren't those other people? It had to be arranged some way, or maybe he was told with Captain Chun and the gang that because you're such a great anti-Soviet, we'll let you see their new, the new radar station they're testing tonight. And he thinks maybe they'll get in, and they almost got out. They did trigger off the radar. We'll do more on that next week. But it didn't stand a chance. But the important thing was that the obituaries were written for him. The next day, I saw who wrote them, and we'll do some of that again and put it on the air. This was pre-planned. And the 12 hours out in uh, Anchorage, letting him leave with this, they could have kept the congressman for the next flight. You remember the flight before and the flight after and the flights ever since got there. So I'm sure the meeting in South Korea would have been done well without him. So getting back to what the uh, gentleman said who wrote this article in the London Times, considering, paraphrase it, the sleazy arrangements of Ronald Reagan, he says, this event fitted only too well with the twisted political myth of our time, myths, plural. It reinforced Ronald Reagan's claim that Soviet Russia was nothing but an empire of evil, and now poor General Romanov, who's dead, can't live to say, I told you so, but there will be other people to take on the struggle to show the lies that our government does in order to prepare us for World War III. This is Mae Bressel. I'll be back with you again on KAZU-FM in Pacific Grove, California. Read those newspapers. Thank you for sending me so many articles, books, information. I really appreciate it. Your listeners are great, and I'm using the material. If you notice, uh, infrequently, frequently, I save it, and when it's appropriate, I use it. I don't use it the next week always, but it's there ready to be used, and thanks a lot for that. I'll be back with you next week, and in the meantime, take care.